Hey everyone, it's Peter Kerr from Rock Daydream Nation. And back in the hot seat, we've got Stan Zabka. How's it going, Stan? Pretty good, Peter. Thanks again for the invite. Fantastic. Today, we are going to do Beatles. We're not going to do the five greatest Beatles songs because that is just impossible. So what we're going to do is just five great Beatles tracks. All eras... Um, 63 to 1970. So, Stan, in no particular order, hit me f- with your number five. Okay, here we go. Um, I tell you what, Peter, I'm glad we're just doing the five great ones because picking the five top ones from 200 songs is just such a daunting task. And I think basically. And we'll do one honorable mention as well. Brilliant. Okay. okay. All right. Um, I'll kick off with I, Me, Mine from the Let It Be album. Um, I don't think it's something that charted extremely well, uh, but I love this song, written by George Harrison, strange title. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you read about it, it was influenced by his yoga readings at the time. Uh, and uh, you must have been quite influenced by it because he also used the uh, song title as the title of his autobiography about 10 years later. So, you know, there's lots of opinion written about the way the song references certain Buddhist philosophies and beliefs, you know, such as egoism. I was reading all about egoism the other day. What, what is it? But uh, that just detracts from the fact that this is just such a good sounding piece of music. You know, I could talk about the way it's put together. You know, it's a little bit artificially manufactured because I had to stretch it out to a reasonable length. But when I first listened to it, uh, that escaped me completely. And I want to ignore all that just to focus on the song for what it is and how it sounds. And, uh, you know, when I read about the background to the songs that were written on the Letter B album, you know, sometimes I wonder just how they got through it all. You know, there was the, the album is, you know, it's all the songs are, are really good quality, but there seemed to be so much dissent, so much divisiveness. You know, there was so much turmoil around the making of that album. So it's a real credit to the band members how they got this together and produce so much quality material, you know, and I find it quite sad, you know, when you read about it, you know, all the issues that the band members are going through putting this together, uh, it's, it's, it's quite sad and depressing when you read about it. But anyway, I like I, Me, Mine, uh, opens with the organ and with that Leslie speaker sound whirling around in the background, uh, builds up to that powerful chorus, uh, and that, you know, it, it contrasts so strongly with the quietness of the verse, and I like that aggressive revolution style of guitar during the chorus. It really does it for me. And so, you know, I really like that. I like the way the song moves from, you know, the, the relatively quiet verses. And when you when you look into it a little bit closely, you realise it's, it's a waltz time. It's a 3-4 time. It's sort of a rock waltz signature. And then it goes into that rocky chorus in the usual 4-4 four, four time. So that contrast really that blend of styles and time signatures, I think that really works together well. And I've heard that in other Beatles songs as well. But this song particularly works very, very well. And I think that adds to it when you're, you're anticipating that energetic chorus. It's just coming. And so when, you, when it does hit you, the impact is so much more effective. Really like the way that works. It's, uh, I like to call it, it's like controlled confusion, if you like, that exists just within the one song. It really makes this song for what it is. And like I said before, I don't think it charted very well, but I don't care. In my opinion, it's a great listening experience. It's a song that I never get tired of listening to, and I'm really happy it snuck into this collection of songs here today. Well done. That's a good uh, selection. Um, one of George Harrison's uh, finest Beatles songs. Um, I was in London and I was lucky that there was a free exhibition of George Harrison's lyrics and photos uh, in London, which was free. And, you know, I had a spare hour while my wife was doing her usual you know, London shopping. And I um, went into this gallery and very privileged uh, to see the original lyric writing of many of his songs and I, Me, Me, Mine was one of them. And, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, that's something that I sort of cherish that I was up close and personal uh, seeing these lyrics. So that that's really good. No, really good selection. Well done. Well, my number five is off the Beatles Abbey Road album. Side one, the last track, I Want You, She's So Heavy. I think this is a killer song. Um, it's got a deep blues riff. It's eight minutes long. Lyrics are quite simple. 
but John Lennon is so passionate in his delivery of the lyric line. It's talking about the angst, the sexual angst that he has, that he wants Yoko so bad and it's actually hurting him. It's a wonderful song. And I think it's also a semi-precursor to Stoner Rock. I could imagine like a Black Sabbath or some of those early stoner bands, even Buffalo from Australia, playing that and, um, you know, and making it their own. It's got a heavy guitar sound. It's deep blues riff. Um, I love it. And I can tell you that riff has been nicked by a lot of bands. I've seen modern heavy metal hard rock i've heard that riff and that outro um played many many times it also has uh use of a moog there's a lot of white noise and the way it cuts off suddenly because it's doing that repetitive riff at the end and then it suddenly cuts off it's quite daunting and then goes to side two and then you've got that wonderful um you know sort of here comes the sun by George Harrison. But where it sits in the album, I think it's got some of John Lennon's most impassioned lyrics and the blues deep riff. And those people think the Beatles are a little bit light and poppy. Listen to that song because it is deep and heavy. And in my view, it has a bit of a, it's a bit of a precursor to Stoner Rock. I want you, she's so heavy off Abbey Road. That's my number five. That's a good choice, Peter. Um, and what I'm going to for my next song, obviously from Sergeant Peppers, you have to put something from Sergeant Peppers in there. Um, and I'm picking Lucy in the Sky to, uh, to introduce here. I mean, you can't talk about this song without referencing, you know, the claim that it's drug inspired due to the LSD acronym. But, you know, Lennon made it quite clear that it was actually inspired by his son's drawings as a three or four year old of a schoolmate called Lucy. Lucy Vodden, I think her name was, a real person. Yeah. Who passed away tragically uh, some time ago. Um, and, you know, that's quite believable, but it's got nothing to do with LSD and it really is uh, built around this story around his son's drawing. But uh, I did uh, see a 2004 article where Paul McCartney said, look, it's drug-related, it's LSD, it's a reference to LSD, just like a number of other Beatles songs were, uh, you know, were talking about drugs at the time. Who's to know? Not important now. I don't want to dwell on it here. Uh, but I remember the first time I heard this song, it's, you know, that haunting opening it, and the psychedelic lyrics, a great chorus. And it all contributed to a, a really good listening experience for me and desire to keep on playing it and replaying it. it it's always got such an impact when, when I listen to it. I, I love it. And it's testament to it being a good song is the fact that someone's copied it. Elton John's version, I think in mid early mid-70s, he did a version of it and it did quite well. Um, and uh, Lennon was there with his pseudonym. I, I didn't realise, Do Dr. Winston O. Boogie, and I didn't realise John Lennon's middle name was Winston, but that was his pseudonym, and it, I think he did it a number of times. Um, and, I, you know, a lot of musicians are daunted by the fact of covering a Beatles song, and Lennon said that himself. He said, why are they? Um, but uh, I think Elton John does a really good job with this one. But this isn't about Elton John. It's about the original, and I love this song. It's got those weird fantasy lyrics i said before it's psychedelic but it's really fantasy uh and they really do it for me uh and it's also a collection and the combination of all those instruments that are working so well together i know they did a fair bit of work in the studio the studio to get that sound but that musical sound really complements the lyrics now george harrison's got that tempera or tambura tempera i think it is uh and that really suits the composition of that particular sound he's, he's got uh in that song and they get creative as well like you know they were playing the leslie the, the lead guitar through the leslie speaker and that's traditionally a keyboard sound so they've they did ex experiment a fair bit and i think it all adds to that very unique sound it's got now i referred to it earlier as being a haunting sound and that's what adds to its appeal i think you know it's got a very unique composition so enjoyable to listen to and it satisfies the criteria that I was looking at and considering when I was choosing these songs, you know. I was saying to myself, did I like these songs when I first heard them? 
And do I still like him today just as much? And the answer to that question here is yes for this song. And I think it's a really worthy addition to this collection of songs, and I'm really comfortable including it here today, Peter. Well, I'm comfortable in uh, hearing you say that because it's uh, it's a uh, it's a corker, and that album is one of my favourites of all time. And you know, is there any better opening three tracks than Sergeant Pepper's, with a little help from my friends, and then into Strawberry Field? Oh, not, not Strawberry Fields. Um, then into Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds, um, and Haunting. There's just so much uh, haunting melodies in that Sergeant Pepper's melancholy, haunting. Um, Benefit for Mr. Kite comes to, to mind. There's some haunting melodies in that, even though it's supposed to be a whimsical carnival. Um, within or Without You, killer George Harrison track, um, you know, with the sitars. I find that very haunting. And a little track that I might be talking about later, which is extremely haunting. So that whole album, and, you know, I misspoke. I said Strawberry Fields Forever, but Strawberry Fields Forever was actually the first song that had been recorded in that session in 1967 um, after the Revolver album. So can you imagine if they found space for that al uh, that track? Yeah, one of my favourites as well, Peter. I love that. Wow, wow wowee. But uh, that's a fantastic choice, and um, I'm of the view that this LSD, I don't think so. I think it, it is very clear that it's a, um, um, a – he picked it up from his son, um, Julian, and I believe the story, it's based on some artwork because that's the sort of um, – songwriter John Lennon was. He would see a, a carnival poster or he would read something in the, the paper and he would sponge it in and pick it up. Likewise with McCartney. So whether there's a drug reference or not, I, I don't, I'm not of that school of thought. I think it, it, the story about uh, his son is, is real. Yeah, I remember John Lennon saying that he said in, he had previous occasions where he admitted to references to drug use in, on other occasions. So he said, why wouldn't I do the same here? So that, that adds a little bit of weight to the fact that it is related to his son's drawing. In that I, I think so. I think so. Anyway, right. That's, that's fantastic. All right. Going um, into the, on the theme from me on a little bit off the beaten track and not the conventional, you've got this album in the same era which was really an EP but turned into an album, the Magical Mystery Tour. And my song is Baby, You're a Rich Man. I just love that. It's got that beautiful um, bass line with Paul McCartney where he's really just giving the strings a bit of a workout. It's got um, that wonderful Indian flute sound, which is off a synthesizer. And I love the lyrics. The lyrics are basically, it's about materialism and says, uh, basically, you don't have to have money to be rich. Everyone's rich. Uh, you can be rich in personality. Um, I think it was a reference to the beautiful people, which was uh, very much the hippie chic of the day with the, uh, the community of the hippies and sort of fraternizing with the rich and famous. But I think it's all about materialism and you don't have to be money rich. You can be rich in other ways. And um, I think it's a lovely lyric, but I love the driving bass and Ringo Starr. <sighs> don't get me started about Ringo. Everyone bags Ringo, but I tell you what, his drum fills are magnificent. And a lot of drummers, modern drummers, could not play the fills that Ringo does. He does these little drum fills and they're subtle and it just adds to the, the song. I can't think of another drummer that is right for the Beatles. I think he just fitted their um, DNA perfectly. And in this Baby, You're a Rich Man, the little guitar stabs from uh, George Harrison are fantastic as well. But the thing you listen to when you put the headphones is the bass. And Paul McCartney's bass playing is just, it's like not lead guitar, it's like lead bass and he's taking over where he's going to the boom, 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 boom. You know, I love it. So that's my number, I think we're up to four. Number two, four, doesn't matter. It's the second one I've come up with and it's Baby or Richmond. I really love that track. 
No, good choice. I like that as well, Peter. I, I love that's a really good track to listen to. I like it. Good choice. Okay, I've got my third one coming up here. Um, and I'm going to reference Ringo's drumming in this one as well, because I think he does a splendid job in, the, uh, in this particular track. Uh, this one's off the Abbey Road album, uh, and it's called uh, Come Together. Um, opening track on the album as well. And it did fairly well. It's number one on the US charts, and it, uh, I think it got to number four in the UK, but it was number one in the US. Great song. I love this. I've always liked this. I've never shied away from this song. Uh, and it's tempted a few people to cover it as well, like Aerosmith did one. Um, not too fussed on it, but it, I think they did a good job. Michael Jackson did one, of course, and I didn't realise I can Tina Turner to cover it as well. Uh, don't laugh. That Tina Turner version's killer. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Um, but I don't, th don't think they did the original justice, uh, these ones. Uh, you know, the, the original is still, still by far the best. Um, and it just confirms how good the original Beatles version actually was. Uh, look, it's almost started life as a campaign song. I couldn't believe it. You know, there was a potential governor of California, and I think John Lennon was just doing the line, you know, come together, it's my party or something. I can't remember what the last bit was. Uh, and thankfully, they didn't eventuate because the contender for the governor's role was arrested later on drug charges. So it didn't continue. Then they, they continued on and created a, a real song out of it. So this song, it impresses because it's great lyric. Oh, it's that psychedelic lyric that I, I really enjoy and great music. You know, it's not just, you don't focus just on a great lyric or great music. It's both great lyric and great music together creates great song. Um, you know, Lennon himself, uh, I, I think the same as he does. It's funky and bluesy. Uh, I heard someone else say the riffs sinister and snaky, and I can't argue with it. I just, I totally agree. That's a great way of describing that riff. It's, it is sinister, sinister and it is snaky. Um, and you just keep listening to it. I just love it. It's a unique piece of music. Um, I know there was a, a legal challenge in 69 because, you know, that line, um, here comes old flat top, here come grooving up slowly, something like that. Chuck Berry. Uh, yeah, Chuck Berry, you're right. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, it was very, and I listened to that Chuck Berry song the other day. They, 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 paid, they paid royalties, so they, they did concede. But yeah, um, they, yeah, yeah. who in that era didn't crib? Yeah, that's right. But, um, yeah, they set her out of court. Yeah, it, it wasn't too big a deal, but uh, it was similar. Um, and I remember Paul McCartney was saying as well that you've got to uh, slow the song down because if you play it at a faster speed, it starts to sound a bit like that Chuck Berry song. I couldn't see that, but uh, that's something else they were talking about at the time. Look, the lyrics are absolutely meaningless. I loved listening to them. They worked so well. And Lennon himself, I, I, I read an article about him. He said, look, the lyrics are gobbledygook, in other words, gibberish. Uh, but I couldn't picture the song being written any other way. You know, it, you know, I don't want to be musing over meaningful lyrics. And it, that would just detract from that great sound. Now, yeah. it's a great collection of sounds. I said earlier on about Ringo's, you mentioned Ringo's drumming in the earlier song. I like Ringo's drumming in this song. He, it works so well. You know, it's very quick fills or whatever he's doing. Best drumming. Uh, I think it's yeah. his. I think it's the best drumming um, of any Beatles track. I think it's one of the best Ringo drum tracks. Very unique drumming. It, it, it mm. is, isn't it? It's very different. And uh, everything about this song is composed so well. I, I, I just love it. Look, it's a standout song in the history of the Beatles. That's the way I look at it. It's got a solid place in those various best song lists that are out there on the net, and you know, published by Rolling Stones, etc. It's always sitting in those lists. And uh, I just knew I had to be talking about this song today, and uh, it sits really well in, in this good group of songs that we're talking about today, Peter. I, I love this one. Yeah, well done. Um, that's a uh, another great opening track. And Beatles have good song tracking. Um, the way they have always killer opening tracks, um, killer closing tracks, killer closing tracks of their side one, killer opening tracks of side two. Um, you know, I think their song listing is very pointed. It's always done well. It, it flows, but they always have an outstanding track on uh, side one. And Abbey Road... I think was probably the first almost perfect sounding album. 
considering the technology was limited, so you had, you know, basically didn't have modern multi-tracks where they can just go in and just add more tracks and, and just go in and go on and on and on and on and on. Um, but, yeah, it it it's, yeah, to me, I think it's one of the earliest kind of perfect sounding albums and um, I think that's an outstanding choice. All righty. My next one it goes back to 1965 and the song is Help. I've always liked that song. I like the lyric and I think it was George, no, not George, it was John Lennon just basically a cry for help. He was um, in the midst of Beatlemania. I think he was fatigued and going through some depression and I think it's a very powerful lyric and it's just basically saying, help me. And I love the urgency of it. And I don't, I know that there's been some conjecture that uh, John Lennon wanted it to be like a ballad and slowed down and, and to be quite kind of emotive in that way. But I don't like it. I like how it's sped up and it's like a um, sort of in that sort of Beatles formula. Um, I'm not a big fan of the John Farnham version of Help because I think that's overwrought. I like it how it was um, originally done as a Beatles song and it's sort of like a perfect type of um, sort of, you know, three-minute rock song. So that's my choice, um, Help. I think that's a good choice. Uh, and early Beatles, uh, I love early Beatles. And But today I was, as I said, I was choosing songs that, that have stuck with me over the years. But back in that, that time, I used to love Listen to Help, She Loves You and all that, all that, uh, all that style of song. And I still like listening to it now and, and watching all the uh, old, old black and white uh, footage, particularly of, the, of that particular song you just chose. But here I'm going more into, and you can see from my background, into the later, I think the last album really, The Beatles, uh, before they went their separate ways, Let It Be. And I've chosen the song Let It Be off this album as well. Um, that might be a little bit predictable, but it, this song did extremely well. It was number one in the US, number two in the UK. You know, there's quite a few versions of this by the Beatles themselves, but I, I, I like this particular version of this album. It sounds a little stronger, it's more impactful, and it's a moving song, you know. The, the lyrics of this song really grab me, you know. Together with that church organ sound, they give that real distinct feeling that there's a very deep meaning that's trying to reach out and break through the surface. It, it always touches me when I hear this song and, and watch them play it on, on, on some of those official videos they've got out there. You know, I read somewhere that um, it was something to do with uh, Paul McCartney's mother passing away when he was a teenager and that influenced somebody, somebody's uh, his writing there. I'm not too sure if that's true or not. Um, but, you know, just like any song, the lyrics are open to, not poetry really, they're open to uh, the listener and the reader's own interpretations, you know, references Mother Mary. That's obviously religious, but, you know, I understand what McCartney was saying, well, you make up your own mind, you know, and he didn't make that concession when he was pressed about it. You know, the, uh, they are meaningful lyrics to me. That's what I like about it. It's got that very orchestral feel, uh, which really does magnify the meaning of the song. Uh, the musical back into the song, it's very powerful. And it leads to a both, you know, I, I call it sobering and uplifting. It's both sobering and uplifting listening experience, in my opinion. And it's such a good collection of different sounds as well. It's got the piano and organ in there. I think Billy Preston was playing the Hammond organ. Uh, I think Paul McCartney was playing the piano. And they get away with that, that church organ style of accompaniment then straight into that distorted guitar lead. How do you do that? That's a great transition, and that combination works extremely well. I think the Beatles do that quite often. Uh, they've got that contrast within the same song, and it just grabs you. Uh, I, Peter, I really enjoy sitting back and listening to the song, and I, I enjoy all those video versions that are around too. Uh, they really draw you in. Uh, and that's one of the things that propels it to, into this list for me. It always provides me with a great listening experience, no matter how many times I play it. It's an absolute Beatles classic, and it had to be a song I was talking about today, Peter. Yeah, well, that's sort of a very iconic song. Um, probably my earliest memory was with my brothers and sisters owning that album and, and playing it in our family. Um, I know my mum and dad used to 
um, love that song a lot. So it's all part of my family heritage. Um, it's an emotional song. Um, it has a lot of uh, resonance, uh, you know, today. And um, watching the Get Back documentary series on Disney and how it came together uh, is, is a joy to behold. And um, it's definitely one of the iconic McCartney um, sort of uh, compositions, which I believe that the lyrics just came to him like in a dream or, you know, sort of overnight sort of thing. That's just unbelievable. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's a, a major song. Rightio, so my next one, um, it's off this album. This is like a compilation album, came out in 1970, um, the Hey Jude album, and it's a compilation of those uh, songs that didn't actually make it to album singles. And I like Paperback Writer. Again, it's another strong McCartney um, song. You've got that wonderful bass line, um, a lot of urgency to his playing. It's got a great riff. And I love the um, background harmonies and it uh, sort of the song is Ferajaka. Remember the old uh, school song that you used to sing? So you've got paperback writer telling this little story and the background vocals of Ferajaka. It's just a wonderful, cute little song, um, but I've always loved the urgency of the, uh, the guitar playing and Harrison and his little stabs. And but Harrison's a wonderfully underrated guitarist because his guitar licks are subtle. He doesn't overplay his hand, but when he, he just chimes in and just puts his little guitar bits, it just adds so much to the song. And I can tell you, you can always tell he's got a particular tone. So if you played me um, a Harrison guitar line, I would know that straight away. Um, he's just got hit that, that particular tone, but really tasty. But again, what I like about this song is Paul McCartney's bass playing. And you know, you've known me for a long time. Um, I'm a sucker for bass and I don't know why I've always gravitated to bass playing and uh, you know, Paul McCartney's bass playing um, in the Beatles is so tasty and in, in, in paperback writer, it's just out of, out of this world. So that's my choice off this compilation, um, the Hey Jude. And um, yeah, this probably will get a release one day. It's one of the, the few ones that um, hasn't been re-released on vinyl. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it on CD. And if it was, it was probably a bootleg. But um, yeah, are you familiar with this one? Have you seen this compilation? Yep, definitely have. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, can't get any more. <laughs> so um, now that they're, you know, mining the catalogue, I'm sure that um, they'll put this together and, and put it out and it will sell like hotcakes. But it's a bit of a combination of their new, their sort of 67 to 70, but it even goes back older to um, stuff like uh, Can't Buy Me Love. They throw that in. Revolution. Now, you know how there's two versions of Revolution. They've got the Revolution, which is the sped up version. So on the White Album, it's a bit slow. It's a bit, it's sort of a um, bit more doomy, but this one is more sped up with um, more distortion. Um, paperback Rider, Ballad of John and Yoko, Rain, Old Brown Shoe. Um, but yeah, it's just all off cuts and singles that just didn't make the albums. And yeah, one day it'll get a, a release. Anyway, Paperback Rider, that's, that's my choice. No, that's a really good choice. That album's good too. I like Rain off that album also. But uh, Paperback Air, yeah, that's one of, one of my favourite songs as well. Not talking about that one today, but um, now this is the fifth one I think I'm talking about. Again, it's off the uh, Let It Be album. I'm probably being predictable here, Peter, but uh, I like Get Back. I, I can't not talk about Get Back. I just can't. You know, it's a phenomenal song. It was number one in about 14 countries, I think. You know, it was UK, US and Australia, of course. Love that song. Um, you know, I'm trying to focus on the studio album version, but, um, but you can't stop thinking about that rooftop clip. You know, I just love the, I just love the energy and the, the movement and everything uh, of, of that particular version as well. But, you know, focusing on, on the, uh, the album studio version, great song. I love the sound of it. Um, you know, I, I th when I listened to it, I was thinking, oh, it's just got that simple driving rhythm. It must be pretty simple. But 
But when I saw them creating it from scratch on that uh, Peter Jackson documentary, I developed a, you know, a new appreciation for how much work went in it creating that. You know, it's, it's, it is a special rhythm in the lyrics as well. Um, you know, actually I was reading, uh, there was something about protest lyrics trying to find their way into the very early version of that song, which was later dropped, which I'm, which I'm glad. But the history around that's quite an interesting read. Uh, but, you know, when I'm listening to the song, I'm not thinking about history and other factors. I'm simply enjoying a song for what it is. It's, um, you know, it's so, so good to listen to. Uh, I think inviting Billy Preston into the song, because I think they invited him in. It wasn't pre-planned. Um, it just wouldn't be the same without his interpretation on that. Doesn't he sport? sort of liven up everything? So when you're looking at the doco series and things get a little bit dour, but when he comes in, it's sort of... Everyone is on their A game and it sort of just invigorates everybody. He's just uh, a joy to behold. He's definitely add, he, uh, adds a bit of spice to the Beatles and that sort of alchemy and it comes out in spades in that song. Yeah, and, and you know, I've I read that when he came in, he just really did pull the band together a bit. Now, there might have been sort of shattering a little bit or scattering but uh but he he turned up and he sort of pulled them together and, and created that new energy that new vibe i mean his his he sounds so great on that fender roads particularly in this song the, that little that little lead break he does it's just brilliant um and this song it's just so synonymous with the Beatles sound isn't it it's just immediately immediately recognizable uh i can't recall anybody covering it or covering it very well or improving on the sound and I thought, you know, it's just a simple riff, but there's, there's more to it than that because no one's really done anything else with it, I don't think. You know, I've been listening to Get Back for 40 to 50 years, really, and um, never once have I not sat there and listened to the very, very last note. Uh, it's just like Let It Be, the, Let It Be the song. It's a truly classic Beatles sound. It'll just never fade away, and I could not not talk about it today peter get back just had to be there for a thousand reasons i could talk about it for hours but it's just such an enjoyable song i love it i'd be disappointed if you didn't bring this into i've known you long enough to know that's one of your favorite songs so i would have been absolutely gobsmacked if you didn't include that in the uh, the five um great beatles tracks um because uh, you've you have always waxed lyrical about that particular particular song that get back documentary that was on disney or is on disney um it's fascinating where paul mccartney's on bass and he's just strumming away and suddenly you see the genesis of get back come into being so he's just riffing on a on a strong um uh, on a string and you can hear the song being pulled together so you're actually a fly on the wall in that in that environment watching this song come from the start it's amazing yeah when um, i saw that it blew my mind it was incredible to see that yeah, you know, getting absolutely light. absolutely and um i've got the original bootleg of the let it be um movie and that's a very dour experience. That's only 90 minutes. Um, it's never been formally released. I think that the Beatles or Apple Corps have buried it because they didn't want it out because it's not very happy. Uh, and it makes you wonder what, why they sort of focused more on the, the Beatles breaking up in that 90 minutes than so much joy that was in the sessions of the Letter B documentary, which Peter Jackson has brought forward in the the eight hours or so on the the disney documentary why did they focus on that sort of you know um george harrison having that little spat with with um paul mccartney because when you look at it in the context it wasn't as bad as it had been portrayed in that let it be movie um but you know missing out on something like that seeing the genesis of how Paul McCartney just strumming on a string and bringing it into a fully realized classic rock track is, is just a joy to behold. Yeah. Killer. Totally agree. That's, totally agree. Uh, that's, that's killer. Well, down to the last one and not forgetting, I'm going to include a honorable mention. So it's effectively going to be six great tracks, but we'll just stick, you know, follow the process. My favourite Beatles album is 
Pepper, Sergeant, you know, Sergeant Peppers, and um, Day in the Life. It's a um, super operatic finish to a, a great album. And I think it's got the best of John and the best of Paul, best of both worlds. You start off with John, an observational lyric. I read the news today, oh boy. And um, that his haunting lyrics, his delivery. Then you've got that little middle se session, you know, woke up, got out of bed, dragged a comb across my head. Wonderful Paul McCartney, just matter of fact. Then it goes back to John. Um, and then you've got that orchestral build-up where the instructions were for everybody to start soaring away. <laughs> there, was, there's no, there was no, like, notes. It was just basically the direction with um, the Beatles via George Martin was, okay, just start soaring away. So people are just going, nah, 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 building up to a climax, and then at the end, that final chord. Mm. I'm getting a shiver up my spine just, just thinking about it. I just think it's magnificent. It's sort of operatic. It's probably a precursor to a lot of that operatic 70s rock. Um, but to me, it's the best of John and the best of Paul in, encapsulated in one song, and it's just wonderful. And um, I find some of it incredibly moving, and I think maybe the Beatles' finest moment on vinyl committed so um there you have it i've got so many versions of this album the curse is real stan the curse is real if you're a beatles fan you see something it comes out i get it yep. here they are brilliant yeah. i think the best band of all time yeah, yeah. what's your honorable mention you know, uh, I, I had a, a bunch of them sitting there because uh, I was thinking oh, we've got to throw in an honourable mention and I thought, you know, when I thought about it, there's yeah. all of a sudden 10 songs turned up there. I think, no, I can't talk about 10 songs. Yeah, we'll do a part two. We'll do a part two, but it's just it's basically five great songs and an honourable mention for the day because there's just so many. Yeah, well, I think the one I'd like to throw in there is, you know, it's off the White Album. And it's back in the USSR, you know. It's hey, that was that was going to be one of my choices. I was looking at that. That's yeah, good. Yeah. It's a very tongue-in-cheek song, isn't it? Uh, there's a lot of history behind that too, and there's you know, it's reference a little bit of a curveball at the Beach Boys. You yeah, think? Definitely. sort of like, hey, Brian. Yeah, and I think they were talking to, and I don't think they were talking to Brian Wilson. I think it is. I was talking to someone else from the Beach Boys when they were writing that song, and I can't remember yeah. who it is. But it's got Chuck Berry influences in there as well, mm -hmm. uh, and I wish I could remember all the uh, all, all the all the cute little lines they throw. Oh, in. there's cute, there's yeah, there's great little cute lines in regards to it. But the the Beatles, one of their favorite albums was Pet Sounds from '66, The Beach Boys, and they just loved it. And I think that they thought, okay, we've got to lift our game. You've got Pet Sounds, so they came out with Pepper, and raise the bar but definitely with that song that was like a um a homage to the the beach boys and uh you know that surf rock type the early beach boys you know the harmonies and the chord progressions and again it's a killer opening song on a beatles album exactly they right. have got their song song listing completely all in the right place it, it's that's a song that I hear it and I always want to play it and I always enjoy it just as much as the first time and it's just and it sounds good as well if, if, if you get all the the lyrics and what they're saying and, and the history of it all it's just a good sounding song as well yeah uh, really good to listen to yeah so I'm, I'm, absolutely that's I mention today absolutely well my honorable mention is in the same album it's in the white album um I've actually bought this in 1981, so it's a little bit discoloured, white album. <laughs> a little. It's not so white anymore because it's been, you know, finger marks and all that sort of thing. It doesn't have a number on it. And you know about the story about the white album, how they numbered it. And um, apparently the closer number to number one is worth more in value. And I think Ringo had number one or number two and he sold it 
and it went for like a six-figure sum. So, um, but all the early Beatle pressings of the White Album had numbers and um, that's something in collecting, Beatles collecting. The lower the number, the higher the value compounded that it's got to be, you know, the disc's got to be in good nick and all, all the rest of it. Anyway, my uh, choice off this album is While My Guitar Gently Weeps. I think that's a wonderful George Harrison song. Um, I think George Harrison was definitely maturing as a songwriter. He was a great songwriter. Like, arguably, some of, you know, something is one of the great Beatles songs, which I haven't included in today, but it's up there with the best of McCartney and, and Lennon. But my, while my guitar gently weeps, I love the guitar work. It had Eric Clapton. The only um, sort of, I think Clapton was the, uh, that was the only time he played on a Beatles track. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I like that the lyrical content, it's, it's very um, melancholy. Um, it just sounds nice. It's, uh, I like the, the sort of the, um, the lyrics, uh, the love that is sleeping. It's sort of like Eastern mystical. It tells us to, to be, you know, kinder to ourselves and kinder to everybody. Um, and I just love the George Harrison sort of uh, the, the guitar work in that particular song. I think it's, it's ace. And, um, yeah, I think that's one of his strongest, strongest tracks. Um, yeah, so that great song and very popular, isn't it? It's often spoken about in, in many circles. So I think it's a great choice. And if you want to see a killer rendition of that, see the Rock and Roll um, Hall of Fame induction where Prince plays with Tom Petty um, and also um, George Harrison's son. And they do a rendition of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. It's absolutely killer. And I, that, that was when George Harrison was inducted. And I think as well as Prince and Tom Petty in that particular year, I, I, I might be wrong. I, I'm sure our viewers will correct me, but it's a killer rendition um, of that song. But uh, And George Harrison, um, you know, he stockpiled so many songs that he couldn't get onto a Beatles album. Yeah, I read that too. He was very, very frustrated, wasn't he? And, uh, very was frustrated. He was always... Uh, it took took first first step um, were in front of him all the time, so he was very very frustrated. But and he got it out on that "All Things Must Pass" album. Yeah, he just right. got it out, and um, that's arguably the greatest um, Beatles solo album of all time. Yeah. Um, but he yeah. was stockpiling it because he couldn't get the material on a Beatles album. So such high quality. Yeah, always underrated he was, George Harrison, but, uh, yeah, he would yeah. make some great songs too. Yeah. One more honourable mention, because we don't talk about enough about Mr. Star, Mr. Ringo Star, because he always used to have a, a track or two. I'm not going to talk Yellow Submarine. I'm not going to talk about Octopus's Garden, but there's a, a really good song on um, the White Album that I like, and it's Don't Pass Me By. It's got that country feel. It's got the, um, the country fiddle. I, I've always liked that song. And um, I think that's really um, an outstanding song on a very good album. Um, Don't Pass Me By with Ringo Starr. I like Hey Bulldog off that album as well. And I like the video. Hey Bulldog's not on this album. Oh, sorry, it's I, on I, I, Yellow, Yellow Submarine. Yeah, oh, sorry, I thought you were talking Yellow Submarine. That's another good honourable mention. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a John Lennon, no, Paul McCartney tribute concert and the Foo Fighters, they did a killer version of that song. Hmm. Um, but hey, Bulldog, that's that's really good, and they've got a really funny video clip on YouTube. Yeah, I love that. I was going to say I like the video clip that comes with that. But you know, honourable mentions, you could have fifty there, couldn't you? It's just you can oh yeah, forever, absolutely. Well, I think we're going to do a part two because, as I said, and I'm, today is not the five greatest Beatles songs; it's five great Beatles songs and an honourable mention. And I think we've picked a pretty diverse range and um, we'll definitely do a part two. So, viewers, tell me what your favourite songs are. Um, Beatles, tracks, um, tell, do you agree with our choices or are there some others that we, we need to consider for the next uh, clip?
let us know. Please subscribe to Rock Daydream Nation. Plenty of stuff on the, um, on the channel and um, I'll catch you soon. See ya.